We'll go ahead and turn it over to Virginia Holman to introduce our speaker, and she is president of the Island Wildlife Chapter. Hey, um, I'm really excited today to welcome Scott Hewler. Scott is the author of seven books of nonfiction, including A Delicious Country, which recounts his attempt to recreate colonial explorer John Lawson's journey through the Carolinas. Scott's written for many publications, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Philadelphia Inquirer, and the Los Angeles Times. His award-winning radio work has been heard on All Things Considered and day-to-day -day on National Public Radio. He's been a staff writer for the Philadelphia Daily News and the Raleigh News and Observer, and a staff reporter and producer for Nashville Public Radio. He was also the founding and managing editor of the Nashville City Paper. He's taught at such colleges as Berry College and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and his books have been translated into five languages. Among Scott's many awards include a 2014-2015 Knight Science Journalism Fellow at MIT, and recently his podcast won a Case Circle of Excellence Award in 2020. He currently works as the senior writer at Duke Magazine and lives in Raleigh, North Carolina with his wife, the writer June Spence, and their two sons. Welcome, Scott. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Um, I think you could have said two adorable sons there, but I'll, I'll look past that. Um, anyway, thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you guys for showing up. It looks like there's a ton of you, which is really nice. Um, this is a complicated interaction. You guys are wherever you are, and I'm sitting here in my office. If you have questions, please feel free at any time to put them right in the chat um, because this is, I'm very interesting. I could listen to myself talk all day, every day, but I'll be honest with you, I have heard it all before. It is much more interesting to me if you talk and then we converse. And I think we can all agree that the point is for me to be happy. And so if you guys bring your questions forward, whenever they come up, we can stop and address them. The more it's like a conversation, the more fun I have. And as I said, the important thing is for me to be having fun. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to bring up my, uh, you know, my PowerPoint because it's always about a PowerPoint. If it's, uh, you know, it's a, a remote call and a PowerPoint. So we want this to feel just like you're in the worst meeting you've ever been at your office. And we'll try to try to bring that level of joy to you. So um, let me get started. I'll bring up the PowerPoint and see what we can do. Um, let's see, open the share tray. Share and that should be it. Are you guys seeing my, uh, seeing the PowerPoint? Yes, we do. It looks great. It does look great, does it not? I, I designed it myself. Um, so hi. So we're talking about John Lawson, who is a, uh, an explorer that I don't know how many of you have ever even heard of until I stumbled across him in research for another book. I had never heard of him. He's been described um, by many people who have studied him as being a good noticer, which is a really beautiful phrase that I love. And I got interested in the phrase. That's what I do. I'm a reporter and a writer. My job is to get interested in things. And I said, where does that phrase come from? Well, a good noticer comes from the voyages of Dr. Doolittle, where Polynesia the parrot has met Tommy Stubbins and uh, is trying to decide of what value he might be to the enterprise. And he's embarrassed because he hasn't got much schooling and Polynesia the parrot wisely recognizes that schooling isn't really the design. And she says, are you a good noticer? And he says, well, what do you mean by that? And she explains to him like, well, if you saw a couple of birds in your yard today, and then tomorrow you saw another couple of birds, would you know whether they were the same birds or not? And I love that 
because it's such a central thing that we should be doing in our lives, which is paying attention. So speaking of paying attention, here's John Lawson, a guy who supposedly paid very good attention. Now, this is a portrait of someone who might or might not be John Lawson. Um, the, the, the only portrait that we have, it was clearly painted in the early 1700s. It was painted by someone who painted the type of people like Lawson was, striving young capitalists looking to get into the royal society and such things. And there's uh, a little uh, plaque on it that says it's Sir John Lawson. Now that's problematic because he wasn't a sir, um, but it, it looks like a young man of about the right age at a painted about the right time by the right person. And uh, the, the piece of paper he's holding, they think might say something about the Royal Society and clearly Lawson wanted very much to join the Royal Society. Um, remember, this was about 1700 when Lawson showed up here uh, in the Carolinas, which were then a single colony. And um, Lawson was a young man looking to make his way in the world, looking to make a name for himself. And uh, he was thinking of going to Rome and uh, looking around and figuring out what to write about. And somebody came up to him in London and put his arm around his shoulders and said, well, I like to think of this conversation. You could go to Rome, but isn't Rome kind of 17th century? The 18th century is all happening over across the ocean in Carolina. And I happen to have a ship. You know, it's kind of like the fox putting his arm around Pinocchio's shoulders. And uh, Lawson said, okay, I'm in. Over he came. And uh, we don't have much information on him. Uh, we know that he came to Carolina in 1700 and that he took a long walk and wanted to tell people about it. That's really all we know. And, and even that we only know from his own book. But um, that's the book. We did, he did write a book and get it published. And uh, hold on, pardon me. Because nothing improves a uh, presentation more than a two stroke engine right outside your window. Um, so he wrote this book and he was interested in, like I said, during the Royal Society, he wanted to do science. And I want you to think about that. The Royal Society, the world's first scientific society, was founded in, I think, 1663. This was barely three decades later that Lawson showed up. Science was brand new. Science, I think Lawson looked at, the and Lawson went to college partially at the, uh, the college uh, in London, where the Royal Society was having its early meetings. That means he was walking around campus and, oh, look, there's John Hook. Oh, look, there's Isaac Newton. I think that to him, that was like for people of my generation being uh, astronauts or to someone like Mark Twain's generation being a steamboat pilot. I think he thought, that's for me. I'll have that. I'll go do that. So Lawson shows up here and uh, stumbles into a group of people uh, who were planning a big expedition. They were planning, they were looking, we think, uh, nobody's quite sure who he went with or why he went. All we know is that he went on this journey. Um, but we have uh, one of the people who I know, you know, I fell into this hole of John Lawson and met everybody who's ever done any research on him and a, a waste uh, engineer, a sewer engineer in South Carolina who befriended me has done decades of research into Lawson and he figured out that there was a group of explorers in uh, hanging around in Charleston, South Carolina, which of course was the capital of the county at the time, and they were looking for a way to get up to the, the tidewater up in Virginia by land. And uh, some of the, the most important explorers of the day and he knows that this expedition took place and it seems to be that Lawson joined this expedition. Please do not think Lewis and Clark, please do not think support from any external organization and please do not think, you know, sort of manfully striding through the underbrush with a machete, you know, uh, making his way through the bush. This was Lawson joining a, 10 other people um, in a big canoe. They, they took off from from Charleston. Uh, six of them were Europeans and four of them were Indian guides, including one woman and including a dog. 
Um, one of the, the things that I love about learning this is that one of the things that I know Lawson never did was paddle that stinking canoe. I like to think of him being like the guy from the New Yorker looking through his little magnifying glass at a butterfly while everybody else did all the work because Lawson, as he, as he writes his book, if any of you have read this book, the part where he describes his, his passage along this trail, he complains bitterly. He complains when it's cold. He complains when it's hot. He complains when it's wet. He complains when it snows. He complains when he complains about the food. He complains about the lodging. He complains about everything. I love it. I would have loved to travel with him. We would have sat and complained to one another all day long. It's fabulous. But in any case, he never mentions, oh man, did I hate paddling this canoe. And when I redid this journey, I paddled that canoe. And in five minutes after I had gotten in the water to start this project, I cared only about two things. One is which way is the wind blowing? And two is which way is the tide running? Because that, that completely controlled whether I was having any joy at all in this enterprise. And Lawson would have brought that up. So I believe that Lawson wasn't even paddling this canoe. He was letting the help do the work and he was taking notes on what he saw. And thank goodness that he did because because of this book, we have a record of the flora, the fauna, the lay of the land, the weather, the geography, the geology, and above all, the people who Lawson encountered on this two-month journey. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about that. How did I find Lawson? I found Lawson because I got interested in telling the story of my house in Raleigh for a previous book, I uh, got interested in like, well, how does the electricity get to my house? And how does the water get there? And when you flush the toilet, where does that stuff go? And who paves the roads and how come and since when and how wide and how do they decide that? I wanted to answer all these questions. And at one point I wanted to uh, trace my little piece of land here in the Five Points neighborhood in Raleigh all the way back to the original eight Lords proprietors. Are we familiar with the Lords proprietors? Surely we are. Eight rich white men who owned everything. That's a hard concept to wrap your mind around as if there could have been a time when a bunch of old rich white men owned everything, but just try to work with me. That's, that's, that's what it was like back then. Um, at any rate, I tried to trace my deed backwards and I fell into a nest of developers. I wanted to stick a knife in my eye. I tried to start from the original maps and move forward and you run into stuff like this and it's all very pretty and wonderful, but there was no way I could trace it. And so I did what all good writers do when you encounter a problem like this. I left that out of the book. I just left it out. And um, I didn't trace the history of my piece of land. But when I was trying to find it, I kept encountering people who would talk about Lawson's trip because Lawson walked right through the Raleigh area uh, in 1701. And uh, I got interested in this Lawson character and I started reading his book. And one thing led to another. And, you know, a decade later, I uh, found myself in a canoe paddling away from Charleston. So um, that meant that I was going to be doing what Lawson did, which was walk around noticing things. And this was a long walk. So this tells you a little bit about the direction that Lawson took. He started there at the bottom at Charleston. He paddled along the coast for uh, about 40 miles. So did I. He got out of his uh, canoe at the mouth of the Santee River. So did I. And then he walked his way um, basically up along the Santee, which becomes the, the, the Catawba eventually leading right up into Charlotte. And... Uh, then from Charlotte, he walked the old Indian trading path all the way to Hillsboro. And from Hillsboro, they uh, some people over there, it, was, it wasn't Hillsboro then, of course, it was Okinichi Village. And some people said there are some Senecas in the neighborhood and nobody wanted to mess with no Senecas back in that time. And so instead of heading north back, you know, continuing up into Virginia, he just went head to straight over to the coast and he ended up in what you and I would call a little Washington and what the uh, Indians probably called in that day the place where that British guy lives with his daughter. Uh, anyhow, it took him about uh, two months to take this journey and we have a thorough diary. Um, it took me about a year because 
when Lawson left Charleston, nobody knew he was anywhere. The, the, the closest person who even knew he existed was 5,000 miles away in London. Uh, Lawson did not have uh, Mighty Mites soccer games to manage and uh, Sunday school carpool. So I could go for two or three days at a time and then come back and then organize the next trip and then go for two or three days at a time and come back. It took me uh, 17 total trips and uh, it was really one of the great trips of my life. I had such a large time. Um, so uh, here's Lawson. Lawson, most people don't know about Lawson. It's terrible. Everybody should know about Lawson. He should be to North Carolina what William Penn is to Pennsylvania. I lived in Pennsylvania for a long time and kids learned about William Penn every year in school. Somebody, something about William Penn would come up and that's important because he was an important character in the founding of that colony. Lawson was literally uh, the first citizen of North Carolina. He founded the first two uh, incorporated towns, Bath and, and New Bern with, with other with people. Other, yeah, yes. Somebody has their, uh, Okay, that got better for a minute. Uh, I was hearing echo. Um, at any rate, and he was gathering botanical specimens. As I said, he wanted to be a scientist and he was sending letters to this James Pettiver, who was an apothecary. And in, in, back in the day, that's who gathered scientific information. And uh, he would send him stuff. And uh, Sir Hans Sloan bought Pettiver's collection. You should know the name Hans Sloan because when he died, his collection formed the basis for the British Museum. And today, if you went to the Natural History Museum in London, which is part of the British Museum, you if you talk your way into the back room, which I did, it's part of my job description, you can see Lawson's actual specimens. I was able to touch them with my own little fingers. It was an amazing experience. Now, that's not always the best part of Lawson. It's great that he was this assiduous collector of, uh, of botanical specimens, but when uh, he went back to uh, London to publish his book in uh, 1708, when he was coming back, uh, in 1709 or 10, I think it was 09, um, his, the boat was beset by uh, pirates and robbed and the colonists that he was bringing back with him were robbed of literally everything. They were cast ashore naked and friendless and Lawson is leading them back, wrapped in blankets at best, back down to, uh, to North Carolina and he's stopping to gather botanical specimens. This is either quite remarkable science or rather uh, disappointing uh, human decency, but it's Lawson. Anyway, so uh, specimens. Um, let's talk about natural specimens. I think we can all agree that these are animals. And I think we can also all agree that these are animals drawn by people who had never seen these animals. Um, these are, there. this is one of two illustrations in Lawson's book. The other one is, is a map. Uh, this, if you look at the top, that's a bison. Uh, if you look uh, next to that, you see uh, a turtle and a snake uh, cuddling. That's something that we see all the time, obviously. Right in the middle, that thing that looks like a rodent of unusual size from the Princess Bride, that's meant to be a possum. Uh, right below that, you see a raccoon riding a deer who hasn't encountered that in their life. And in the bottom, uh, right, you see a raccoon and what he's doing is dipping his tail in the water to uh, fish for crabs because the Indians told him that that happened and Lawson uh, uh, believed that story and uh, passed it on to us. Of course, I did a little research on that story and learned that that story is like Jack the Giant Killer, right? Jack the Giant Killer, that's Jack and the Beanstalk, that's uh, Odysseus and the Cyclops, that's David and Goliath. We have stories, wherever people are, the story of the smart little guy out thinking the big dumb guy exists. That's, it grows wild like the dandelions. Evidently, so does the story, story of, of, of some for crabs or fishing with its tail. Uh, it shows up 
all over the world. And um, it's just one of those stories that humans like to tell each other or like to tell their gullible friends. I just love to think of the Tuscarora saying like, tell him the one about the raccoon, he'll believe anything. At any rate, Lawson believed it. But so he was gathering information, he was writing things down and uh, it was an amazing thing that he was doing and we have the book as a record of it. The other thing we know about him uh, is his death. Uh, Lawson famously, if you know about him, this is probably the only thing you know, is that in uh, 1711, he and uh, uh, his pal uh, von Grafenried, who uh, helped him found New Bern, uh, were gathered up by an angry group of Tuscaroras uh, and uh, held, it was the beginning of the Tuscarora War. The uh, Tuscaroras, like all the native tribes here, uh, dealt with uh, colonists telling them over and over and over again, okay, this far, no further, we're good, we're good, we just wanna plant this area and gather some food and then leave us alone and we'll leave you alone and everybody will be happy. And of course, actually it turns out we need another you know, thousand acres, so we'll just be moving in. And it went on and on. And the uh, Tuscarora actually applied to Pennsylvania to move up to Pennsylvania to get away from these rapacious North Carolinian colonists. Uh, the people in North Carolina, uh, the people in Pennsylvania said, Yeah, okay, you guys can move up here. We just need a note of good conduct from North Carolina. And the people of North Carolina said, No, sorry, we will not provide such a note of good conduct. So the Tuscarora were either going to sit in North Carolina and be enslaved and uh, killed uh, and dispossessed. That was their only option or else they were gonna fight back because they couldn't leave. So so, so they so they attacked uh, the, the colonies at that point. It was vicious, bitter war for a couple of years. Uh, surprise, surprise, the people with the steel guns won um, and, uh, uh, Lawson uh, von Grafenried was freed by the uh, by the Tuscarora. They may have believed he was the governor. They may not. They weren't sure. But at any rate, they uh, freed him. Lawson, they did not free, and they uh, they either cut his throat or hung him or poked him full of pitch pine and set those on fire and let him burn to death like candle. Um, historians like to think he burned to death because Lawson describes that manner of torturing someone to death in great detail in his book. Uh, historians love irony, so they like to think that nobody knows. All we know is that he was killed, um, which is interesting and kind of especially heartbreaking. They weren't wrong. Lawson was a developer. Lawson was bringing people over and Lawson was developing the territory. Apart from his wonderful scientific observations, he was also developing. And in fact, when he was, when uh, one of the people I interviewed in South Carolina on this project uh, talked about Lawson's death and he said, a friend of his had told him he was a developer and he get what they all deserve, which is really hard to disagree with at this point. But at any rate, um, Lawson also was utterly unique among his cohort in that he treated the natives, the Indians, as fully human. They are really better to us than we are to them. They give us victuals, they give us quarters. Um, we think them little better than beasts in human shape, though if well examined, we shall find that for all our religion and education, we possess more moral deformities and evils than these savages do. Lawson deeply admired the Indians. Lawson loved the Indians. Lawson urged us to intermarry with the Indians, to learn how to live in, in uh, concord with the, the, the earth the way the Indians did. Uh, we did not take that advice, but uh, Lawson, you know, as, as important as his observations of the birds and the animals and things were, his his observations of the Indians were more important than anything else he, he did. Um, now, why, why do a thing like I did? It's obvious why I would wanna do it. Oh man, I get to go camping for a whole year and I get to wander around and then I get to write a book about it and tell everybody everything I found out. That's pretty cool. Okay, but why would anybody else want me to do it? Why would a publisher give me a big bag of money and say, go ahead, Hewler, take a big walk and then write a book and we'll, we'll publish it? Well. 
this really brings an important point up. This is, uh, we've heard of Joseph Grinnell, of course, and Grinnell's surveys of, uh, of, of Yosemite, especially, is, is the one that is most widely known. But he did these surveys of California, and as he points out, these will be valuable 100 years from now or more. And so ecologists are looking 100 years later at what Grinnell found. Same thing, we look at what Thoreau did. Do you know that people look at Thoreau's notes from Massachusetts from 150 years ago and learn, well, here's how much earlier spring comes than it did in 1850. Well, it's almost two weeks, you guys. If that doesn't terrify you, you don't understand because a season is 13 weeks long. If the seasons have changed by two thirteenths in 150 years, climate is changing at a truly unheard of gallop and we are in big trouble, which is of course true. Same thing, Aldo Leopold, uh, you know, uh, his Sand County Almanac, his famous, famous uh, environmentalist book. We go back and we compare what's here compared to what Leopold described. So the point is, I didn't want to do, I didn't want to slavishly retrace Lawson's footsteps. Am I exactly where Lawson did or am I a mile over or whatever? No, I wanted to do what Lawson did. I wanted to take a long walk and look around. I wanted to bring a second data set to Lawson's original data set. So that's exactly what I did. I headed out. I wanted to be that good noticer that uh, Polynesia the parrot encourages us to be. So um, the question is, what did I notice? So danger, vacation slides ahead. Here comes some stuff that I saw. And it's amazing stuff, I think. So thing one, Spartina alterniflora, one of the most important uh, plants on the planet. It creates the mud beneath its feet. Uh, it works with the snails. It's, it provides shelter for all of the, uh, the, the juveniles of all of the fish that live near the coast and many that live out in the ocean. It's an astonishing. I fell deeply in love with Spartina alterniflora as I paddled through it in my first week. And importantly, if I would paddle into tide you know, tidal creeks at different times, I would see exactly what you see here. And I would think, do you know what Lawson saw 300 years ago and what I see today? Exactly the same, exactly the same. South Carolina has done a wonderful job uh, protecting its coastline most of the way. And so, you know, it's a beautiful thing to paddle through this Spartina. I couldn't, I can't say enough nice things about it. Um, and then you go, uh, I, Bulls Island is right there. Uh, I paddled onto Bulls Island and it looks like a place where they got into the Triassic and they thought, okay, the Triassic is good enough. No need to continue on. Look at this. This is an astonishing place. And to see how Lawson described it and to compare, to compare the birds Lawson saw with the birds that I saw was really a thrilling thing. Um, then uh, now it's important that you know um, Lawson was guided every step of the way. I don't want you, again, he wasn't, you know, just wandering around and, and trying to figure out where it was. He went from Indian village to Indian village and he and his gang you would have an Indian guide and they would walk into the village and they're like, hey, we're here. Who's got a place for us to sleep? Plus we're hungry. Uh, bring us something to eat, would you mind? And we've got some stuff to trade with you for the food and the lodging. And it was much more like, you know, don't think Lewis and Clark, think like road trip. It was much more just fun. And he had guides. This is uh, Katie Winsett, a, a really now dear friend of mine who I met through this trip. She's an ecologist. And so she led me along. And each, each night we would sit and go over maps and figure out where we were going next. We had a good sense of where Lawson had gone. We would go there too. Um, and we would see things like, it's important. It's not just the physical world that we were, you know, not just the natural world. It's the human 
world. Is, is there anything more satisfying in this world to see than close out on a clothesline? It just speaks of a life well lived to me. But the point is, I like to ask people, if a beaver dam is the natural world, how is the Hoover Dam not natural? I think that the people and the way they live are an essential part of the natural world. And so just as Lawson did, and he described the Indians' cultures, he described their languages, he described their, their funeral practices, their religious practices, their cultural practices, the food they ate. We have this vital record because Lawson was looking and, and gathering information. I hope 300 years from now, somebody will look back at my book and, and say, okay, we learned something from this. This is what it looked like 300 years later. Now, but some of it looked almost exactly the same. Is this straight from central casting or what, right? You wouldn't want to walk too close because a big green webbed hand would reach out and grab you. I love this kind of stuff. This is just astonishing. Um, and to walk through these swamps, uh, this is called halfway swamp because it's halfway between uh, Charleston and um, the trading path. Um, it's just an amazing thing to see. Um, and again, as I said, you you gather information on what you see. This is one of those things where I was like, oh, I wanted to bring this home. This was so cool. I want to bring it home and uh, re you know, recover it. But uh, fortunately, other members of my family are wiser than I am and suggested that perhaps I did not do that. Um, here's uh, an example of, you know, Lawson was fed by the natives. So was I. I could call my book um, a guide to the uh, fried bologna sandwiches of the Carolinas. I recommend this as a traveling practice. This actually looks like a barbecue sandwich. Of course, I sampled barbecue too. And so here's me and Lawson having lunch. Um, I Instagrammed this everywhere. And I think the law is that if you're going to have pictures on, on Instagram, a certain amount of those pictures have to be of food. So here's an example of that. Now, here's another example. This already is back in North Carolina, and this is not, quote, natural uh, fauna, flora, but it's what's growing here now. And to walk among these seas of tobacco, and you see these coastal plain skies where the clouds just want to recede into eternity. This was a, a beautiful experience for me. I loved that. Um, you see, you know, you walk by people's porches in the Carolinas and you're going to see stuff like this. And I am here for that. Um, Lawson calls uh, called the, the Carolinas a delicious country, uh, meaning that it was just Look like it's delicious. Um, he calls it delicious twice. And uh, I could not agree with you more. How, it, in what way is this beautiful Piedmont countryside not just delicious? Um, now, on the other hand, what did I see more than anything else? I saw this. I saw the, uh, I saw places where people once lived being reclaimed by the uh, by the environment because Lawson walked through and he knew it. He understood. 50 years before he came, Indians were living the way they'd lived a thousand years before. 50 years after Lawson, it was full on perukes and buckle shoes, colonial America, right? We It was a completely different world. Same thing for me. 50 years before I walked through here, we were still in post-war prosperity and the world still looked like something that made sense to us. Does anybody care to imagine what the world is going to look like 50 years from now? Would anybody believe they could predict what the world is going to look like five years from now? We are on a knife edge between what has been and whatever is coming. Lawson walked through at the same time and he understood it. And as I walked through rural South and North Carolina, I could not fail to see it. These abandoned towns, these abandoned houses were heartbreaking. Early on in his uh, description, Lawson describes going to a little village uh, along the coast and that it's just, there's no one there, that, that he sees no one there, this abandoned village. And I had that experience over and over. 
Um, and I'll read to you briefly about, uh, about that experience. Um, as the trek left the lakes and parks behind, the land we passed still included trees, but we started to see more crops like cotton and soybeans. Traces of cotton lined the sides of the road. We regularly passed enormous bales, picked and formed by machine, covered in tarps still in the fields. But it was spring, so we saw tending, not harvesting. At the center of one field, we saw a copse of trees, undergrowth, and vines, and realized that in the middle of that brushy spot was a two-story house, abandoned. Once we had left the state forest, abandoned houses had become a commonplace along the trail, as powerful evidence of the changing world around us as the paved roads and empty churches. I photographed many of these houses, and this one looked too good to miss, so we headed up a double track that ran between rows of the field. We quickly encountered a tractor that we hadn't noticed was occupied. As we stood and talked near the trees, considering whether to approach the gray house within, behind us the tractor suddenly rumbled to life, spindly brown steel trusses of a spraying mechanism unfolding and spreading outward like the wings of some great wading bird. It began hercule rolling up rows of cotton, spraying as it went. Nitrogen, Katie explained, fertilizer. Michael said when he saw it, he thought, praying mantis. Katie, ever the ecologist, thought, threat behavior. The machine trundled off and we crept through the jungle undergrowth to the abandoned house, probably the home of the family that once farmed those acres. Up brick stairs, across a rotting porch, and into the decaying living room of a silent ruin. Once a room of color, the broad parlor was a pale, was a place of pale blotchy greens and washed out grays. Paint peeled from the ceiling, fallen fragments curled among the dead leaves on the floor like late snow. The bay window bulged into matted undergrowth, a wide archway opened into the rest of the dead house, wallpaper seemingly rotting on the walls. Black smoke traces around a painted brick fireplace betrayed despairing final owners or careless squatters. A stairway led up, but we did not climb it less from caution than from sorrow. A family had lived here once, and its traces barely clung to the walls. Empty houses. The town of Jamestown was little more than a gas station and a church. The little crossroads of Horatio with his store was barely there, and Haygood simply was not. The farms people once worked belonged to corporations now, most of the jobs done by machines. We were getting our first sense that, like Lawson, we were seeing not a culture in flower. We were seeing the end of something, shells like those Lawson had seen on Capers Island or the ghost trees of Boneyard Beach or the empty town of Alwindaw, the silent record of a vanished tribe, the life that sustained, sustained them was gone. So that's the type of thing that I saw. And I just can't tell you how powerfully it hit me. In this last picture, if you look, you see the uh, green, red, and uh, orange dresses hanging there. I can't tell you when the last time that secondhand goods store was functioning, but the record of some family trying to find a few dollars worth of value from their old nice clothes just broke my heart. Um, so how did Lawson tell this story? He used multimedia just like we do. The, the picture on the left is, of course, the, the, the animals that we talked about. The picture on the right is Lawson's map. It's very nice. It's not of much value. We have, we had much better maps then. We have much better maps now. It's just pretty. We like it. I, I think it's beautiful. And if you had bought Lawson's book, you'd have one. And I would envy you. Um, how did I tell the story? I blogged it, I Instagrammed it, I tweeted, I used every single tour that I every single tool that I could. Um, Google Maps, if you go to the lawsontrack.com, you can go to the Google Maps of this uh, interactive Google map of this tour, and you can go as close as you care to and see every step that I took. It's amazing. Um, this is uh, examples. Uh, you can see what my campsites look like at night when I was writing. I, sometimes I would write in my journal and just take pictures of it and put those up on the log, on, on the blog. People loved that. Um, uh, on the right, you see uh, some uh, Huguenot 
uh, descendants. That guy there on the left, he, uh, I was having uh, coffee and cake with them in his house, not two miles away from his great, 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 great grandfather's birthplace. My grandfather was born in a shtetl in Poland. So think of the worlds colliding then at that point. And it was wonderful to get these people stories, to have them tell me the stories of their lives, which is, again, exactly what Lawson did. And I want to tell you the most important thing to me was the stories of the Native American people, the Indian people who came out to visit with me and who invited me back to their uh, to their um, to their residences and their meeting halls. And here, um, this is the vice chief of the, the Santee tribe. Her name is Peggy. And she told me the story of growing up in uh, South Carolina in the, uh, as the third group in a binarily segregated culture. She said if in her, the school that she went to as a little girl, if a white child wanted a drink of water, well, there was a water fountain on the uh, wall. If a black child wanted a, wanted a drink of water, there was a junkie water fountain for them. If an Indian child wanted a glass of water, the principal had to walk over with a cup of water because there was nowhere for her. She didn't fit. How much more erased could you be as a culture than that? It was a shocking story. Now, and here, another story that you may not know is Charleston, the great slave port of Charleston. In its first 50 years, it shipped more Indian bodies to the islands to live a brief, horrible life cutting sugarcane and then die than African bodies into the Carolinas to work as slaves on plantations. I'll say that again. More Indians were shipped away from the Carolinas than Africans shipped into the Carolinas in the first 50 years of Charleston as a slave port. I didn't even know Indian slavery was a thing. So that's one of the many things this book opened my eyes to. Um, I talked to these guys uh, and uh, we talked about uh, the guys at the top, talked to me about the hanging tree. Uh, in Salisbury, which nobody mentioned when I was walking through Salisbury. The guy on the bottom explained to me why he thought uh, the Confederate flag was an okay thing to be hanging around. And uh, I, uh, I made a rude gesture with a, a single finger. And, uh, you know, when, when he told me that uh, he didn't mean anything other than heritage by his flag, and I said, you know, a lot of people think of it differently. And I made a gesture, not in his face, but I demonstrated the gesture. And I said, what if I told you that gesture meant I wanted you to get a prostate exam because I was worried about your prostate health, not something ugly about it. And he laughed and he understood, but he didn't take down his flag. Again, walking through, hearing stories of lynching that nobody in the city of Salisbury told me until I talked to two black gentlemen and hearing how this man wanted me to understand that the Confederate flag did not convey a message of slavery or, or racism. My job was to be out and listening to these stories. And it was a, an amazing thing. More, you know, I learned how to do the, the surveying. Lawson was a surveyor. I learned how to work the surveying tools of his time. I learned how to do barbecue from an actual barbecue guy. Here's some more uh, flora. The, uh, those are sundews on the left, those big, be those bright, beautiful things. They're about the size of the nail on your pinky finger, but I had a good lens. And uh, Lawson never saw them, but because I had an ecologist leading me, she could uh, tell me about them. Um, if you go to South Carolina, you go to 40 Acre Rock, uh, you will see these little ecosystems. Lawson described them to a T. Lawson described a place where a big rock was jutting out of the earth and he sat down and had lunch there. And at that place now on Flat Rock Road, there's an enormous quarry. So we know where Lawson went and I was able to go exactly where he went and see exactly what he saw. When he came, it was rock sticking out of the ground. When I came, it was a quarry. Um, the last thing I want to show you, this is a nice picture of, of a little lake that I stayed at. And uh, I was pretty happy with this as a, as a picture of a camping site. And then uh, there was a time where there was a, Google had this auto enhanced thing. And uh, 
it uh, it turned that picture into this. Now look again, this is the original. When Google gets done with it, I'm Ansel Adams. I don't know how, but it's the best picture I've ever taken, and I feel like I didn't even take it. Um, so that's Lawson's book, and that's my book. And uh, I will say thank you, and now um, I will stop sharing my screen if I can figure out how to do that. Um, stop sharing. And um, we should be getting back to, I'll get my camera back on. And I think you should be able to see me now. Is that correct? Yep, we can, yep. We can okay. see you now. Okay, so I would love to answer questions. Um, I have told you a, a lot of things in a short while, and I'm bored with what I have to say, and I would like you guys to ask me questions, and I will make things up on the spot and tell you okay. lots. Okay, if anyone has questions, you can type them into the meeting chat or you are welcome to raise your hand uh, and unmute yourself. I'll I'll start things off a little bit. Scott, on your on your blog I was reading earlier, uh, you described Lawson's new voyage to the Carolinas as something of almost like a big sales brochure to potential colonists. And I'm wondering if you might talk about that a bit and uh, and and Lawson's perhaps impact on the development right. of the area. Well, that's that's exactly right. That's if you read an awful lot of these uh, these books written about uh, North America, it was you know we complain about oh everything's in the hands of the developers. Land boondoggle is in our DNA as Americans. Europeans came over here for one main reason, because there was land and you could get it, and all you had to do for it was erase the people who lived here. I, I, there's no other way to say it. Lawson, you know, was telling his story. He wanted to share the scientific information. He wanted to be recognized as a person of importance and power, but he also wanted to develop land and make some money. And so to do that, there needed to be people to sell it to, so there, you needed to write in a way that said the Carolina that the Carolina was the greatest place in the world. And if you just came here and bought some land from John Lawson or the other people who owned it, all you would have to do is sit on your porch all day and watch the crops grow by themselves and trundle themselves to market and the money roll in. So that's exactly what happened when he met uh, Von Graffenried uh, in, uh, in England. Von Graffenried was trying to take some uh, some some Protestants out of Switzerland to uh, find a place to settle. Lawson and Von Graffenried got together, brought uh, founded New Bern, brought people over. It was it was some of those settlers who Lawson was traveling with, who were beset by uh, pirates and and so forth. And then they were dragged around naked for weeks by Lawson while he gathered uh, while he you know, he, he gathered botanical specimens for uh, for Pettiver, but um, bringing people over was essential to the enterprise of colonialism, of having a colony. And so part of what Lawson was doing was, and I'm not sure he would have thought of it in those ways. I think he just would have thought this is obviously the thing to do. Everyone should come here. There's land here. There's you know, there's opportunity here. You can, if you show the smallest amount of of enterprise, you're going to be rich over here. And he he complained constantly that the English who came over were lazy and they didn't do well. Whereas the French, who he saw the Huguenots, they were very enterprising and they were very. He thought their colony was very healthy. So he just thought that was an important thing. And um, he was a man of his time, you know, as we say now. That's uh, that was Lawson, and, and so part of what he was doing was, you know, it, it, you learned in your high school uh, English classes that all writing is uh, trying to convince you of something, and uh, Lawson was trying to convince you that leaving Europe and coming to North America was the right thing to do. Meg is asking, uh, what's the most interesting thing that you learned about John Lawson? 
the most interesting thing that I learned about John Lawson, well, um, my favorite thing was that um, nobody really knows who he is. So everybody, you know, people will do research and they think this guy or they think that guy, they find somebody in the historical record. A lot of people think he was this 34 year old, 35 year old guy who came from, uh, from Roy, from significant wealth. Um, I don't believe that. I believe he was a, another guy, a 25 year old guy who was the son of a physician who went to Gresham College for a while. And that's the guy who I think would have been fascinated by the, uh, the Royal Society. But what, what I think absolutely cements my, uh, my belief um, is that Lawson comes out of this journey, pops up uh, like a whack-a-mole in, uh, in Little Washington, and he meets this guy, uh, Smith, and his daughter, and Lawson hooks up with the daughter instantly. And to me, nothing says 25-year-old man, like, oh, I've been camping for two months. Hey, there's a girl. Let's get married. You know, that that just sounds like a, like that <clears throat> radiates 25 year old young go getter to me that let's do this thing. And uh, he became her common law husband and they evidently were very happy together. They had children and uh, we think that there may be uh, descendants of them. But again, the records are so complicated that you chase them down and Maybe, maybe not. You know, I, I met somebody who was sure he was one of Lawson's descendants. And by the time he and I finished our conversation, we were like, no, no, you're not. But um, that's one of my favorite things that this young guy, and like I said, that he never paddled the canoe. I loved that. I loved b coming to that and feeling like I am certain of that. And, and I will claim it. And you could put it on my tombstone. Hewler died whenever. Lawson didn't paddle his canoe. You can, you can. Okay. Uh, the North Carolina chapter uh, is asking, are there any botanicals that are named for Lawson that you're aware of? That's a great question. Um, I would have to look it up. I don't think so. I think that I would remember it because like there's, you know, trees, Franklinia up in, uh, you know, that were, that were named after Franklin and we're well aware of that. I don't think there are. Um, that uh, at least not in the records that I have seen, but I wouldn't take that as gospel. I would look up, I would look it up, I, but I don't think there are. I, I see Julie Moore getting a, a book down from a shelf. Is she looking it up <laughs> to see if there's... This is great. That's Julie is a, a brilliant botanist, so <laughs> she'll, she'll chime in if she finds one. Um, I'm going to move on to Bob's question here. No, she doesn't see anything. Uh, Bob, no, no. Julie, Julie's shaking her head as well. She's she's confirming. Look, I was right. So now, <laughs> if I was right on that, you can now believe every single other thing I have told. If if it's verified by Julie Moore, it's 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 good it's good intel. Uh, Bob is saying that he finds it fascinating that Indians were sold into slavery from South Carolina and is asking if you have a reference that he could peruse. Are there references in your book? There are references in my book. Um, if you don't mind my standing up, I'm going to grab two books that I can tell you about. The best book that you can read is this one, The Indian Slave Trade, um, which is, as you can see, quite a tome. And it's, uh, it's won uh, an, an important historical prize. And it's just, it's heartbreaking. It's like reading, uh, if you've ever read The Half Has Never Been Told um, about the African, oh my God, you know, it will break your heart, a book like Oops. this, and it should. Who is the author? The author is Alan Galay, G-A-L-L-A-Y. I don't know that that's the proper pronunciation of his name, but that's, uh, and there's another book called The Tuscarora War, um, which gives you a lot of information about, <clears throat> you, you learn about Lawson in that, you learn about the Tuscarora War, 
Um, and there's some there's some information I remember learning about the Indian slave trade in there. In fact, I think I may have first encountered it there and then gone to get the Indian slave trade uh, for myself. So that's and it's heartbreaking because they they figured out well. Indians make terrible slaves if you try to keep them on the farm because you turn your back and they melt back into the, this, it's a home game for them. So they figured out that they had to sell them to the islands to derive value out of them. It's, it's a horrific story, but very much a part of our history and uh, good for people to know about it. I'm very glad that I learned about it and can now uh, share it. That's, uh, you know, to get people, I write books, when I'm writing a book, by definition, nobody in history has ever cared enough about the topic to write a book about it before, which means I'm not writing books about highly well-known things. Um, so I, it's, it's a great privilege to, I think, I hope bring Lawson more to the fore. He's a very, very important person and uh, in many, many ways, an admirable person. And, but once you're bringing that story out, you find things like the Indian slave trade. And it's so important that people understand that, how vital that is when we look at how erased Indian cultures are here. And, you know, you know, that they have to apply, you know, as Indian person after Indian person told me we're the only minority group who has to prove who they are. That they, you say you're an Indian, the government says, prove it. Which tribe, how, why should I believe you? It's astonishing. It's heartbreaking. And there's a lot of that in, in the book. I encountered a lot, people from a lot of tribes. They were overwhelmingly, enormously helpful and kind to me. And they told me stories that it is my immense privilege to share. Wonderful. Um, Terry Buckner has posted something in the list uh, in the chat, an article that lists all of the specimens that Lawson collected. If anybody wants to get that. Right. Uh, yeah. One one thing, you know, so much we've only got about a minute left, um, but so much of the landscape and, and some of the routes that Lawson traveled 300 plus years ago have been altered beyond recognition. And you traveled much of his route on foot. I'm I'm curious in a minute <laughs> if you can tell me what's been lost that you would like to see restored. Well, um, I think what is lost cannot be restored in that what's lost is pathways through uh, through open land or through forest that are that are natural, like um, roads partake, if, if we have any platonics in the audience, they partake of road nests, you know? They are, a, nowadays, if you want a road somewhere, you just plonk it down, and if there's a hill in the way, you bulldoze it, and if there's a valley in the way, you fill it with gravel. Not, it didn't used to be that way. A road would be, it would, it would find the, it would go to the ford in the river, the rocky place where you could cross the river. It would uh, go to the good cleft between two hills. It would follow the uh, near to the ridge line on on the side of a mountain, but it would be on one side, you know, ten feet down, so that you weren't visible to everyone walking along. You know, if it was uh, if it was walking along a river where the road was, would give you information. It would say, "This is." the highest part, this is the lowest place that even in the rainy season stays dry. You know, when there's an immense flood, okay, the road might get washed out. But the trail is where even in the wet season, it's still dry. So that would tell you how far the swamp would come. You know, if you were walking by in the dry season, you would know, well, the road's over here, the river's way over there. I bet during the spring, this whole area is a marsh. That I loved that, and I walked on some of those passages. And now sometimes we still have their bones, right? Um, I-85 follows the railway, which follows the old trading path, because that's just the way the country wants to go. Uh, countryside wants the road to go, but you know, you get to a certain point, and you 
you just start fighting the country or uh, subduing the countryside. I loved the sense both uh, Lawson describing the villages and the way the villages would be set up and the villages were not so permanent. You know, he wasn't, these weren't migrating tribes. These were tribes that settled, but they were building out of very natural materials when it was, you know, if, if you had sort of over hunted, you would just pack up and move, you know, 10 miles in one direction or the other. And there was that sense of trying to figure out how the countryside wanted to work with you, whether it was road building or settling or farming that really Lawson clearly loved that. And, uh, it's not something we do super well anymore. I think Ed Harrison had his hand up earlier. Ed, if you'd like to unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, no, I unmuted. Yes, you are. Okay. Yep. No, it was just uh, uh, Mr. Harrington posted something and I think he corrected the spelling in it. It was, it was a note back to him. I don't think I had my hand up for anything else. Okay. Mr. Harrington, do you have a question? Okay, he's muted. You're muted. There, I got it. Thank you. Uh, yes, um, not a question, but a comment uh, that uh, William Byrd II uh, surveyed the dividing line between North Carolina and Virginia uh, in the 1730s, and his descriptions of the the flora and fauna are very interesting uh, and really support what um, John Lawson found. <clears throat> I've used the information. I've used the information in John Lawson's book uh, in a forest ecology short course that I taught at UNCC for the um, um, Native Plant Studies course. <clears throat> So there's a lot of good information there. Yeah, no, that's great. And Lawson's information was great. And as you say, Bird's information corroborates Lawson's information. And Bird has uh, some kind things to say about Lawson's surveying, that he's like, Lawson did a good job. Lawson started one of the surveys up there, although the, the people uh, at the time didn't like him much because there was a dispute about the boundary line, as there always is about boundary lines. and so. Lawson would fail to show up to meetings and stuff like that because he didn't like he didn't think the meeting was going to go well, so he wouldn't show up. So that's uh, but uh, yeah, that uh, that uh, William Byrd book is is a wonderful book. It's uh, if you enjoy reading uh, primary sources uh, after you read Lawson, go right to the dividing line. Byrd's book is is really fun, fun reading. Well, Scott, this has been fantastic. We've run a little bit over. Uh, oh, wait. Mr. Harrington, you have your hand up still? No. OK, <laughs> great. This this was fantastic. I really appreciate you taking so much time with us today. Um, next week, we have Professor Roger Shu coming on to speak about the Green Swamp and management of uh, species like longleaf pine and um, fly traps with fire. And we're getting all sorts of comments in the chat, Scott, thanking you. Um, this was extremely informative and enjoyable, and we really appreciate it so much. So, well, it's my pleasure. I really enjoy it. Uh, if, uh, if you have thoughts, go right to lawsontrek.com. There's an email. A link there that goes directly to my phone or my desktop. So if you have thoughts, if you have questions, or just want to tell me how great I am, you can shoot me an email. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks so much. Have a great Thanks day. Bye-bye.